Hello and welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast, the podcast for event professionals featuring leading innovators in the event industry. My name is Miguel Nevsch and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of EventMB. In this episode titled The Power of Building a Community, I have the pleasure of speaking with Sam Allen, founder of conferencemcs.com. Sam discusses her entrepreneurial journey and her focus on building a community around her new company. We cover things like why difficult journeys make us more resilient and lead to better products and services. Why sustainability needs to be a major consideration for all event professionals. Why building a community and not an agency is the key to success. The key differences between a TV host and a conference MC. How many of the big challenges the event industry is facing come down to siloing. And we discuss dealing with the permanent changes to business travel and events. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation and I invite you to check out the other episodes of the Event Manager podcast, which also feature insights from today's most influential event professionals. You can find all the episodes on our website and we invite you to subscribe through your favorite podcast service. And now for a word from our sponsors. PHL Life Sciences, a division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Host your convention or trade show in Philadelphia, one of America's leading life sciences hubs. PHL Life Sciences, the first and only CVB division of its kind, will connect you to the professionals at the forefront of your industry and to a culture you can only find in Philadelphia. A city known for its rich history that's forging a bright future, Philadelphia challenges the expected and defies convention. A world of discovery is waiting. Visit phllife.com to learn more. So welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast. I am joined by the amazing Sam Allen. Uh, Sam and I have known each other for a long time, uh, but uh, for those people who do not know who Sam Allen is, I'd love to start with a quick introduction. Sam, welcome to the show. Please introduce yourself however you'd like to. I was just trying to count the number of years we have been friends, Miguel, and it's too many now. So we'll just say many, many years. Thank you for having me on your incredible podcast. Yes, my name is Sam Allen. I am the founder of a new business called conferencemcs.com. I have been, um, uh, I suppose, a veteran or an old lady of the event industry. I've been involved in our wonderful sector for over 20 years in a variety of different roles, starting in sales in beautiful venues in the UK and in Scotland, followed by venue consultancy across the globe. Um, before I landed the dream uh, dream job of becoming a professional conference host and conference moderator. And that has now expanded and grown to the launch of this incredible new um, network and community that we launched this week. Great stuff. And um, if you don't mind, I'd like to dig in a little bit further to into your journey, because I think you've had a very interesting journey uh, in, in, you know, we like we talk about pivoting. And so many people pivoted in, in kind of March of 2020 um, into the kind of digital world. But your pivot starts a bit earlier. I think you had uh, a kind of a career change. You, you, you got. When did you start really trying to, or you know getting into the MC world and, and and really specializing in that? Well, I think there was something or someone um, that I couldn't see poking me and moving me into the the world of MCing and moderating for many years. Um, as you'll know, I have been a very active member of Meeting Professionals in uh, International MPI. I was chair of the UK and Ireland chapter for a few years and quite active in the UK event industry community. So due to the, the job role of the chair, you're, you're a natural facilitator and moderator of board meetings, of uh, membership events that we would be running. So I've been uh, hosting for many, many years, and that spread out to other industry associations and industry events. Um, and I look back now and realize that's probably because I was fairly good at what I was doing, but I didn't see it then. I just think, think that, you know, sometimes also, if you want to ask someone to volunteer, you ask the busiest person in the room, and that tended to be me. 
I then worked with um, Martin Venest on the Fresh Conference in 2018. He asked me to run one of the hubs. And for those of you who don't know anything about this, please go and uh, check out Fresh because this was innovation before we were all forced into uh, changing and pivoting in um, in 2020. So Mar we... Martin was a guest on our podcast, I think the fifth or sixth guest. So we have a little bit of backstory there if you want to listen so, to that as and well. And go and check that one out. Yeah, because he's, an, he's and he is also very integral in, in my journey. Um, so he... He did literally throw me in to host the Fresh uh, London pod, and it was an incredible sandbox working with some great people across Europe, uh, South Africa, and the United States. And it gave me a huge amount of confidence, but yet again, I still didn't realize that this was a career. People don't talk about the, the value of, of this particular role. It's always been overlooked it's overlooked in event budgets it's overlooked as um as an important part of the the stakeholder in the design process so as the year went by i was struggling with my consultancy business at the time i was sad and tired and working on my own and and hitting a pretty big low point until i got a call from somebody i worked with at that fresh conference and they asked me to come and be a moderator for a pharmaceutical client in Basel, of which I said to them, no, because I, I just had no belief in myself. I thought I could only host and, and facilitate in the world of the events industry because that's what I'm comfortable in. I understand our ridiculous amount of acronyms and I just didn't feel confident in uh, anything else, any other sector. And I'm very grateful to those people, um, audience, who pushed me and pushed me and pushed me and explained that they didn't need that content expert. The room was full of those people. They needed a people and an engagement expert. So I've never been more scared in my life. That was, um, that was in October, 2018. And I went over to this academy. It was the seventh year they ran this academy and it was their most successful academy that they've had. And actually I can say to date, because I don't think they've had one sadly due to COVID. Um, Everything went wrong in terms of, you know, the technology didn't work when we needed it to work. Um, content subject matter experts didn't want to come up and, and be the host. So I needed to jump into very, very challenging scenarios, but I thrived. It was the best feeling in the entire world. And that was the pivot. Then I realized that I've loved everything I've done in the industry and I've loved the successes that I've seen uh, with my teams, but this was a different feeling. And so reluctantly, because I thought it was really a bit pretentious buying samallen.com, but I came back and I did. I then fortunately got the gig to host MPI's European Meeting and Events Conference um, in 2019 at The Hague. And, and the rest, they, they sort of say, you know, <laughs> is history. That's brilliant. Well, thank you for, for going there and, and talking about this journey. I think it's, it's really interesting for listeners to, to kind of understand and Obviously, you know, an amazing kind of transformation. I know you also did a lot of training, uh, you know, you did training on, on all sorts of areas. And then, of course, with the with the COVID pandemic, you, you kind of also pivoted once more, just that just as you were sort of, uh, you know, getting into full pace with with MCing. And then you you've also done a lot of virtual MCing during um, well, during the last two years, really, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, it was a lovely feeling in uh you know, the back end of 2019 for the first time as an entrepreneur, I I had a whole diary full of business for 2020. I was in a really, really good position. I was excited about the future. And as we know, everything went horribly wrong in March of 2020. And yeah, I lost everything. I mean, within two or three weeks, every single event that was in the, the diary had, you know, had gone, had been cancelled. And at that point, there was still so much uncertainty about what people would or could do and i think in those scenarios you have two choices and you know it's it's survive or die and you know i i still had a mortgage to pay and bills to pay and and so yeah i decided to take um that quick step into learning and education and understand the online world whilst not respecting it and thinking it was somewhere where we could create engagement 
but I was proved wrong by some incredible people who run online event design courses and um, the skill set that I I'd you know worked on in in person looking at how we can change engagement virtually and then the faith of my clients they knew that they had to do something so we we pivoted together we went through the online design processes together we failed horribly together <laughs> and we came out you know with some some incredible events and some and great successes in that virtual world and you know it's it's been a real challenge for us all um, but the great thing about when you work with a host who's been doing this now, you know, week in, week out, we don't need to worry about jet lag anymore. Um, yeah. You know, developed a huge amount of experience in understanding what does work and how participants respond in this digital world. So it's been an incredible learning journey. Absolutely. And once again, thank you for for being so honest and, and generous with with your storytelling. I, I've been very impressed uh personally i think i just want to say I, I see your your journey at a distance and i'm always like what is sam up to now uh and sometimes i don't get it sometimes i go i don't understand why sam is doing this um but the results have been very impressive so congratulations uh, and i know that you have a, a new baby now uh which is no longer samallen.com it is now conferencemcs.com uh and how what what made you Kind of go in this direction now and can you explain what it is as well yes i can if i can't then i probably should fire myself as being the founder <laughs> of conferencemcs.com um so if i explain what it is and then the journey that that's got us to uh where we are this week um conferencemcs.com is the first of its kind global network global community of professional conference mcs hosts, moderators, and facilitators. If as an organizer, you're looking for um, a host or an MC there, and I've watched this in uh, various different forms and talked to very, very uh, many event professionals about it. Uh, conference MCs are, and, and hosts tend to be independents or they tend to be people who are linked as a speaker uh, their, their primary role would be a speaker, and then they may take on this role as an opportunity via a speaker bureau. But a community where we're bringing people from all around the world hasn't existed until now. And the reason behind this and the journey of conference MCs stems under three different pillars. One is sustainability, one is diversity, and one is experience. Um, like you, I don't have, this is my baby, baby, but I have a wonderful goddaughter called Sophia. She was born in 2020 and I cannot look her in the eye and then jump on a plane to go and spend two days hosting an event in Las Vegas when I live in London. And I had been looking in, and researching, you know, how can we change this sort of concept for some time? Again, diversity is very, very important. And anyone who knows me will know I've been banging the drum about this for many, many years. I think it's important to see people on a stage that reflect your audience or are a direct contrast to your audience, but it really does have to be a consideration when you're looking at that content and you're looking at your participants, wherever they may be in the world. So that was really important to me to create a diverse community that people can reach into and tap into that will give extra value to that conference and that event experience. And the last thing is experience. I think a lot of people, and I'm sure there will be um, many of our listeners today who will say, well, you know, my sales director wants to be the MC and, and it's seen as this sort of glamour role. I think the last two years in the world of digital has, has, has made people realize it's, it's a big firefighting role. It's all about troubleshooting. It's all about making sure that no matter what is going on, whether it's digital or in person, that these links are professional, they're seamless. The broadcasting element of, of hybrid and, and digital really does mean you need a professional, someone who knows what they're doing, who is versed in this, who has got the experience. And our pool of associates are all incredibly experienced professionals. Mm -hmm. And then for the associate, it's very difficult for us. We, uh, our team, our associate, our network are, are incredible. But of course, there's only one of, of Sam Allen or, or you know, Miriam Staley, whoever it might be, and the economies of scale that our industry need in this, in this type of role. 
means that we're unable, you know, we can only do one job at, at midday on a Wednesday. And so again, how can we service uh, the, the corporates and the associations in a better way? And also we have, we have to remember travel is difficult for people. And we've had the situation already in the last quarter of trading with conference MCs, um, where I was unable to travel to a conference due to the, the, the travel bans and the isolation. I couldn't physically, it was, a, it was a pivot to a virtual studio and I physically couldn't get there due to my other commitments. So in the world that we live in now, and thanks to conference MCs, we could put one of our professional hosts in who could travel easily from Europe to Europe without any isolation. And so, you know, we've got that proven success on, on all of those three pillars. And that's how the journey of conference MCs came about. We have been trading behind the scenes um, to make sure that it's a, a working and it's a product that works for our clients as well as our associates. We've mm-hmm. built up a, our community of professionals, which will continue and is continuing to grow. So we felt it was important that um, we started telling the world this week. And, and that's because a year ago, my dad died. And we felt it was a really fitting legacy to my dad, who was very much a part of the business, a big, 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 big passionate promoter of everything that uh, we stood for. And I couldn't think of a better day to do that, to mark his, you know, his legacy and his important input into the the growth of what has now become Conference MCs and its family. Wow, very symbolic and uh, what a, what a nice uh, tribute in a sense. Um, I mean, you know, I'm very familiar with different you know, speaker agencies, speaker bureaus. Um, so is this an MC bureau? Is that sort of a, a good way to put it? But but kind of an international one with with people all over the world in a sense. Yeah, I'm. I'm always a bit. I, I'm, I'm not fond of the word bureau. I'm. I am think. You know. I think there's. There's a lot of words, and we can do a whole other podcast, Miguel, on words that we can't stand in this industry because we've talked a lot about these when we've had a beer in the past. Um, I think we've got to look at modernizing it and speaking a language that is more familiar to the people who we're working with. Um, I think because we're. You know, we, we're not. You know, just selling out. Uh, MCs around the world we've actually got a community so our community is meeting and talking sharing best practice we've got some exciting plans that uh, that it's going to be around professional development for our conference MCs associates so we are different to a speaker bureau where we would be simply representing these um, incredible professionals we are actually building out this community to increase their experience increase their exposure work better, learn better together, which hopefully means that we're giving an incredible experience for our clients and their participants. Sounds really interesting. So you have people all over the world, and I totally get the um, advantage of that, about getting to venues, uh, getting to locations where events are happening. How does it work in terms of joining? You know, how do you select the people that join? And how do you ensure that they are at the level that you require? That's a great question. We have um, an associate application form that um, we ask everybody before we even consider them to become part of the network to complete. And that has a whole range of questions. You can see that that's on our website. We start with that and that is constantly evolving as we are learning more about what our clients needs are and as we evolve, evolve the technology. The second part of that process is we vet that, we look at that, we do all those big considerations that you would do in any recruiting situation. And um, back in the day, if you remember when we first met, I was actually a recruitment consultant. So again, using that experience of of understanding, you know, checking out everybody's social media, going and actually speaking to clients about uh, their testimonials or recommendations. And then um, the process at the moment is I personally interview and I vet every single associate. And ultimately, as the founder of this business and as a professional conference and experienced conference host, there are key criteria that I know we need as uh, people in our community. So with all of those as a recruitment uh, process, we then um, onboard. I 
very much stay hands-on when a client needs that. And we take each client's event, as we know, they're all very, very different. And the response from our clients has been really, really positive. And again, with our associates. So our associates have that community. They have me as that support. Our clients have that you know, 24 hour access to support where they need it. And again, our community at the moment, and you know, never say never, we, we launched two days ago. Um, whilst we have a global community, the people in our community are people who are experienced. You know, we're not going to grow to be 20,000 hosts at this point, because what's important for us and for our clients is that quality and that experience. And that's that model that we'll draw as we do continue to grow. Absolutely. And what would be a, a good number, do you think, of, of hosts, of, of, of associates? What, we, what would be the, the big number you'd be aiming for? I mean, I'm excited. I'm excited that, you know, I didn't realize and, you know, I, I went on a fabulous course run by uh, the team over in uh, Holland, you know, the Masters in Moderation course that was back in 2014. I didn't know it was a thing. I just didn't know it was a career. And I'm really excited that we're bringing this new um, this new role into the sector. I think it can be incredibly flexible, which is the excitement of the network. You don't have to, you know, necessarily be a nine to five worker in in the world that we're living in. You've got that wonderful opportunity. You could be running a different hustle alongside, and you know, some of our hosts are authors or hoping to be authors or work in a you know a slightly different sector. Um, we have somebody who's an associate who's actually a doctor. He's just really passionate about hosting. You know, he's not changing at the moment, I, despite me asking him to. He's not changing his career as a, as a GP, but he, you know, where he can, he wants to continue hosting. And he's absolutely incredible. And sometimes our clients do want someone who's got that, certainly in the pharmaceutical or the healthcare background, they want sometimes those people. And that's another exciting um, yeah. element to the role that we have. So what's the number? I think it will also depend on our clients and the events. I mean, how many events do we do we run in the world? You know, I'd love to see again, as, as we move forward, look out quarter three for some really exciting things around training. I'd love this to be, you know, when people say back in the day, I want to be an event planner or an event manager. Well, I'm really excited that, you know, hopefully in the next, you know, what, three years, three to five years, people will say, I want to be a professional conference host. And that is exciting to be a part of. And are you looking to do, I assume this is all in English at the moment, but what about the rest of the world? Are you looking to do other languages as well? You assume wrong, my friend, because as okay. I'm sitting here learning, um, I'm, I'm, I'm currently living and, and working over in Spain. Um, although I won't be hosting in Spanish anytime soon despite my twice a week school and my constant practice but yes we've got hosts um as we know the majority of our events around the world are conducted in in English but at, we have clients who've asked and we have uh so again Europe so Germany France quite often are looking for native speakers and we have those people on our books. So that's one of our big questions as well. You know, we've got people living uh, all around the world who've got different languages who can actually run those events in different languages. So it's actually part of our, you know, our fabric is that we want to make sure that we are, again, really inclusive to the language side, as well as also the accessibility and, and the ability of people as well. It's really important to conference MCs. Absolutely. That, that makes sense. One last question about this. You know, I, I see a lot of similarities between conference emceeing and TV presenting or something more kind of media related. Are they that similar? What are the main differences here? Like, what are the skills that you need to have on the MC side that are, that are different from TV presenters? And I ask this more from the side from thinking, you know, why don't I just get a TV presenter to be my MC? Uh, what are the kind of things that may not work as well in that case? I think that certainly in the digital world, you know, we have a lot of RMCs and, uh, and hosts working at the moment in studios, you, you know, uh, in terms of that confidence behind a camera and that ability to multitask. So, you know, it's it's super fun when you're in studio where you're having at least two different people talking to you in your ear, you're needing to read an auto cue confidently. Those are all skill sets that a TV presenter has. 
So 100%, you will see some TV presenters. And in fact, a couple of our team have, have, have been uh, TV broadcast journalists um, as, as part of their previous career. Where we differ is that we are in the business of two-way interaction. Remember that thing that we do, it's meeting and it's people and it's engagement. What one way broadcasting tends to be, you know, the way with maybe a wee piece of social in terms of TV, we're doing something that's adding a, a great big, very complex layer. And please, anybody listening, don't underestimate that complex layer of how do we create that two, three, six, 12, 1500 way interaction using different types of technology in TV. We're in, you know, we're using three, four cameras. Um, very sort of standard, incredible technology. We're working with um, engagement platforms. We're working with different people on different devices. We're working in different languages. So the complexity layer is just that little bit more, um, yeah, fun. And I would, I would ask for that experience because that's the piece that creates the legacy and the behavior change in meetings and events. I think if you've got somebody as an MC who's got that TV background, I think that's you're ahead of the curve. But if you can layer that with that two-way engagement piece, which is what you would get by coming and talking to us at conferencemcs.com. Are you ready to celebrate your successes in the world of meetings and events? The Skift Meetings Awards are back for 2024, recognizing the most innovative business events companies across 15 categories, and we want you to be a part of it. Winners will feature on Skift Meetings, sending a clear signal to events professionals around the world that these are partners they can rely on. The final deadline for submissions is June 11th. We encourage you to start your submission today to secure the best entry rates. For more information and to start your submission, head to live.skift.com. So let's talk a little bit about the event industry. I mean, you've t you've had many different roles. You've seen it from many different perspectives. Um, if you could change anything in the event industry or a number of things in the event industry, what do you what do you think that would be, and and how would you change it? That is an absolutely gigantic question, Miguel, and I'm not in the same room to flick you on the arm. I think, I think we have a, an industry, a, an incredible industry, and um, you know, the old MPI adage: when we meet, we change the world. We are part of life-changing experiences for people, whether that's consumer or business, whether it's in healthcare, retail. It, it doesn't matter. We are, we're privileged service providers to you know, life-changing experience. I think if we could not be so siloed, I think we've built ourselves various different languages across the sectors within the event industry. I think, I think we're our own worst enemies, to be really honest with you. And I think that we need to collaborate better across the broadsheet around the world um, from an association point of view, from a language point of view. I think we need to look at how we educate and how we talk about what we do as a profession and and without sounding corny, you know, professionalize it. I think it's it's and we've seen it in the last two years. What's the first thing to go? Any crisis, the pandemic will not be the last crisis that we go through in our business lifetimes. You know, we have we've got a huge, huge challenge challenge in terms of sustainability and our sector is not characteristically sustainable we've got huge challenges with diversity with accessibility in what we do and I think as we also move more into a digital world we've got some really big huge challenges that if we keep siloed we're not going to be able to face and overcome and that is probably something that I'd love to see um, a shift that's forget that I'm working in exhibitions or conferences or live events or brand activated events. You know, I think if we can come together with some sort of global, you know, context as a community, I think it would be great. I, you know, I, I see people who, at COP and I, it's great, you know, the event industry and we have 250 signatures. It's like the event industry has got literally millions and millions of people working in it. And we got 250 signatures and we call that the industry. So yes, I'd love to see that. Um, 
I'd it like sound like to a look. lot of what you're saying. It comes down to communication, right? It it sounds like what you're saying is the industry is you know a live events industry, but somehow the communication around what we do and the professional side just isn't working somehow. Is that? Am I reading? That I think wrong? if you went through your whole podcast and all the people that you've talked to, I think you know. I think. I think we could very easily pick 10 different names and ask them exactly the same question about what is the industry. And I put my fingers up in those little inverted commas and you'd get 10 different answers. And that for a sector is, you know, when we talk about hospitality, we've always, we don't want to be part of hospitality. We talk about marketing. We don't want to be part of marketing. I think we need to define who and what we are as a, as a global community um and be okay with that and again um i think that's a massive challenge for for us but it's something i feel like we need to overcome yeah i mean i've personally definitely been part of quite a number of attempts at defining the industry and uh sometimes i feel like we shouldn't spend so much time defining what we are and just accept that we are part of multiple industries and and kind of move on because it feels like every time we define we exclude you know somebody says no that's not quite right yeah. that's not how we should I, think about this but let's make a call on it and be that and have that i mean in terms of that definition if we haven't as you said if we haven't got that definition let's be okay with what what we are and how we serve and and to me we serve you know pretty much every industry in the world to create behavior change that leads to, you know, to, to life changes and, and ex incredible experiences. And I'm okay with that. I've, I feel incredibly proud to be part of that, whether, you know, whether I'm, I'm and I've never sat, you know, you know, when you have the tick box, are you an event planner? And I try and do the surveys and then I get to a point where, no, I'm not. But <laughs> I have a degree of that in, in what I do. Am I a yeah. supplier? Well, and, you know, I think we need to take away, as you said, you know, be okay with not having a definition, but actually certainly work, work closer together. I think we need to come together on things like um, creating positive change in terms of sustainability. I think we need to see bigger initiatives being tackled before. I think we're very good at reacting because we are in events. So we used to, you know, something happens on the day and we react and we deal with it. And I think we need to change that outlook for, a positive future and look at you know what is going to come next in terms of the challenges that you know us and our clients are going to be facing which is you know a bit of why we're doing what we're doing with the business sounds good well let, let, let's stay there in the future and um, mm -hmm. just kind of explore maybe your vision a little bit about the future of events we've talked about things that maybe aren't quite right and we'd like to tweak but how do you see and, and how do you see conference MCs being part of this, you know, brilliant vision of future events, which, you know, I, I, I assume you think is, is going to be brilliant in terms of the future events. What are you seeing when you, when you look into the future? I think, and I've, I've said over the last 12 months, you know, out of this has come incredible change in, in, in how people are thinking about their events. And I think it's, going to continue to evolve over the next you know couple of years as we manage ourselves out of a pandemic into this whatever this next normal is i think events are an incredible way to communicate strategy to bring people together to increase business uh whether that's in sales whether that's in exi exhibiting i think that the evolution with technology i think it's gone into lots and lots of shiny stuff out there at the moment whilst people are figuring out um, what they need and how that best is going to respond to their business. I think we're going to see people asking the question. I spoke to one of your colleagues actually about this. I think we have to accept that people are going to ask the question about the validity and the reasons behind travel, but we knew all of this stuff was coming. You know, we have been um, harping on Miguel about ROI and about data and about measuring and about design and looking at that entire stakeholder process. And I know that you have just recently uh, been with the guys doing CED. I think I'm seeing that happening. You know, 
we've seen a much bigger move into strategic meetings management. Your CFO is not going to put on the 50,000 person event in Las Vegas if he hasn't done it for two years and the businesses continue to profit. He's going to be looking at alternatives and we need to be ready wherever we are in that line and we need to be agile to that. I think we're going to see, you know, travel um, restricted. We're seeing that already within healthcare that, you know, budgets have gone where a doctor may may have attended 12 different congresses in a year. That's just not going to happen. So I think we're going to see some amalgamations of of associations and and congresses, which I think is super exciting because then we can really place some great design into those and hopefully lots of wonderful hosts to help link and, and bridge that. I think the technology element, as we get a little bit more confident with it, I think as costs go down, as we drive more into the digital world, we're going to create more accessibility. And I think that agility through that digital and in-person um, experience that we're going to create is going to be very exciting. I think we'll see people you know, travel to the US and maybe either attend a super event or a big section and I know people, I know a lot of people are not loving hybrid, but I think as we get better at it and we start, you know, sharing those case studies of success of hybrid, I think we'll build those communities out and that will continue to happen. And again, having hosts, having those professionals in those locations to help make these these events become a lot more seamless than than maybe they have been will be of real use to clients. So I am very excited. I I love change. I love to see positive change. I think we've got some real hurdles to to jump over. But I think, again, as a a community, I think we can can do that. Sounds very interesting. And so if the CFO comes to you and says, I'm not doing the 50,000 person event, uh, I want to do something else. I want to do something with better ROI that's inclusive, that's agile, all these things. What's your starting point there? You know, what do you, what do you, what do you think that that person should then focus on? I think it's always been the same thing. I think before you say, I don't want to do something, it's, it's understanding the why about whether you want to, or whether you don't want to. And I think that if we can get more conversations at that level on that, the why behind uh, what we, we do or what we don't want to do with, and, and understand those stakeholders, those people who are actively going to have an impact or be impacted by whatever that might be. Again, I am 100% not averse. If the reasons and if the design is valid and you've gone through that process and bringing those people together is going to create a positive impact and a legacy and a change in behavior, and you can build that data and, and give that reasoning behind it, great. But I think we're going to see a lot more of those questions asked and how can we how can we use, I think, again, how can we use technology rather than, you know, remember the old days. We Hopefully some of you don't remember them because you're still very young. But when conference apps first came out, you know, everybody wanted an app and nobody asked why they wanted an app. Nobody used the app because they hadn't asked the question of what validity the app had for their particular audience. So we're going through a similar process, but I think due to the length of of people working from home, becoming a little bit more digitally comfortable, I think now is the time where we'll we'll see those questions being asked. How can we build that experience that creates that same feeling, but without it hitting the planet, hitting the bottom line and using, uh, you know, technology that is successful and can work. So Ah, can't wait to let's review this in two years and see if I've talked a load of rubbish or not. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. A lot of opportunities there, which I think is, is excellent. Sam, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm gonna ask you the last question that we ask everybody, and hopefully you have a, an answer prepared. Who should be our next guest on the event manager podcast? Wow. Well, as you had him on number five, that's you know, that's I don't know what number you're at now. Um, We're at 32 my, or 33, oh, so we've, we've had a few SIDS. My age, my age, nearly. Uh, yes, I would have 100%, and I, you know, without harping on, I would have said Martin. I think we are bandying around the conversation about engagement, and I'm frustrated that we weren't talking about it so much before uh, coronavirus, but I'm delighted that it is now a big 
conference uh, planning conversation at the beginning. I think a great person to talk to about this who has been doing this uh, with people is a wonderful gentleman called Tim Ferguson from an incredible company called Audience who are all about engagement. They have been all about engagement across digital as well as in person for many, many years. And he was the person that gave me that first break, gave me the confidence in, in being somebody who can engage with participants and clients. And so, yes, that would be my recommendation. Sorry, Excellent. Tim, we'll if you get... don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get some Just throwing you details. under the bus. <laughs> Absolutely. No, nothing nothing uh, better than, uh, you know, publicly mentioning someone and then hoping that they'll uh, accept, right? <laughs> Sam, it's been a pleasure. Good to catch up and good to have you on the show. Thank you for uh, sharing your journey with us. It's very inspiring and I hope a lot of people will take uh, a lot out of that. Uh, I know I do. So uh, thanks again and uh, see you soon, hopefully on the Event Manager podcast. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Event Manager podcast. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For the latest news and the best articles on technology and innovation in the event industry, head over to eventmb.com.